welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be talking about the difference between a solicitor and a barrister. Now I know this might seem basic to some who have an interest in the law, but the things I'm going to explain are kind of more detailed than just, oh, one does this and one does that. I'm going to cover the training that you'd need, what the actual job is like in practice, what type of clothing that you'd have to wear to do it, what type of employers you might have, and also how to actually get a foot in the door for that role. So I'm kind of going to cover things that it took me, honestly, the first year of my law degree to figure out, so I thought I would sit and share it. So the first half of the video is going to be about a solicitor, so I'll put the timestamps here for that. and. The second half is going to be about barristers, so I'll put timestamps here for that one. Without further ado, on to the first part. So the type of work that they would do really depends on what level of firm that you get. So if you're in more of a high street firm, then you'll be doing sort of a range of things. But if you're in more of a city firm, you'll be niched into one area. The actual things that you would do, so like trainee tasks, you could be like proofreading documents, you could be attending meetings, meeting clients, drafting up case notes, that type of thing, more the hands-on side. Obviously a solicitor gets the case from the very start when the client walks in the door and then hands it off when it gets to the court stage. So the majority of the big chunk of a court case is dealt with by a solicitor. So that's sort of the work that a solicitor deals with. They are of course employed, so the nature of that means that, you know, you get holiday pay and in some big firms you get, you know, sickness and private health insurance, you get gym memberships, you get a lot of perks and obviously you get the security of having an employer and you can have a pension and all of that. The hours really depend on like what type of firm that you go for. So for example, Magic Circle and more like big city law firms, it will be very common to do a nine till nine or a nine till eight, like that's just standard. Whereas if you're in a high street law firm, realistically, you'll be doing a nine till five probably, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter, it depends. So, you know, and obviously the pay reflects that too. So the salary in city law firms, especially Magic Circle, is standard to be like a hundred grand post qualification. So you do your training contract, then when you're actually a qualified lawyer, 100 grand, that's standard what it is. American firms pay more, so that would be like 120, 130. Whereas high street firms will probably more 30. So, you know, yes, you're working less hours, but you're getting paid less too. So it swings and roundabouts really. So the clothing that you wear, um, Again, it's sort of like business wear for solicitors, so depending on the, the level of firm that you're at, I'm sure it's more relaxed at sort of high street firms. Normal business wear attire is what's expected for like solicitors, generally. So the types of firms, I guess from the bottom up, you could say you've got like legal aid, pro bono, clinic type stuff. Then you've got your high streets, which is, you know, the things that are found on every high street ever. Um, and that deal with like matters for the general public. So then you have like regional firms, so firms that may have an office or two, but just in a specific, like the North or the South or okay, whatever. You have national, so firms that have offices everywhere in the UK. And then you have the city, the global dominators, which basically have offices everywhere. And you'll also find that big city firms in the UK, they'll pretty much just have an office in Manchester and London, but then outside of that they'll have offices like everywhere whereas obviously if you wanted to be somewhere other than manchester or london you'd probably have to go to like a national firm so now for the portion of training and what you can do to actually get a, just a job as a solicitor which you know i want to know too really so training so you can either do your law degree it's normally typically three years and you need a qualifying law degree that's a caveat that's important to point out because there are law degrees in the UK that aren't like qualifying law degrees, so then you still have to do the GDL afterwards. So you do a three year law degree or a degree in something else. If you do a degree in something else, they only do the GDL, which is the Graduate Diploma in Law. It's a year's qualification and it basically crams three years of law into one year, so you can imagine how fun that is. And then after that, so you're kind of like at the point of law degree, GDL, then you'd go and do the LPC, which is the legal practice course. 
Um, and that's basically, it can be six months or nine months because the six months is like accelerated version of it. Again, fun, I'm sure. Um, which is basically kind of teaching law that you don't get on an undergraduate law degree. So more like your corporate, commercial, taxes, real estate, those type of things. The type of law that you would need if you wanted to practice at a city law firm. Um, so, and it can't teach about finance and all of that type of stuff. So you do that for six to nine months. And some firms also require you to have a master's as well. So you can do a master's in I think three or the six months or whatever. So it makes it up to like about a year anyway. Oh, I think it's also worth pointing out that if you get a big city law firm, they normally pay for the GDL and the LPC. So they'll pay for your tuition costs and then they'll also give you a maintenance grant. So I know for example, some magic circle firms give you about eight to 10,000 um, to live off as well as paying the tuition fees, the LPC and the LPC is expensive. So that's sort of like really helpful to know that they can sort of pay for that. So it's always worth keeping that in mind when applying for training contracts. And then after that, you do your training contract. So your training contract is two years. You typically do four seats. A seat is six months and a seat will basically be a six month sort of period where you're in a specific department and you're learning about it and then you move on. Um, most firms in the, in London offer a secondment for any of your seats. So if it's an American law firm, you can get to go to America. If it's not, you might go to a charity or you know another office or something like that. And then basically, once you do your four seats, so your two years of training contract, which you get paid for, by the way, I need to point out, when you do your training contract, you get paid. If you're in a city law firm, probably get paid about 40, 50,000 each year, goes up each year as well. Um, and I'm not sure about high street, obviously the pay will be significantly less, but yeah, you do your training contract and then you're a qualified lawyer, woo. And then that's when the big money comes in if you're at the city law firm. So that's kind of how to get there. And so it typically takes obviously three years for um, any, a degree, then maybe optional GDL, depending on what you studied, years legal practice course, two years creating contract. So, you know, six or seven years. It's not, it's not a quick thing. <laughs> and finally, how to get a job. Um, so the best way to get your foot in the door is get on any scheme you can possibly get on to be a solicitor. So there's like the first year insight schemes, apply for them all. Even if it's an open date, apply because graduate recruitment, if you kind of make an impression on them, they remember. Even things like going to the law fair, speaking to firms there, you know, you literally can kind of get like recruited by some of the firms because they'll be like, oh, we like what you're doing. Oh, come on, like speak to us about our firm. Some firms like Clifford Chance, for example, I know, have messaged people via LinkedIn prior to the law fair, getting certain students to come and talk to them. So that's sort of a good way to go about it. Then obviously as you move into second year, regardless of what degree you're studying or third perhaps if you're not doing law, um, you can do vacation schemes, which is basically anything from I think three days to two weeks, where it's basically you do work experience for that time and at the end of it, you do sort of an assessment center. I know some vacation schemes, they like test you all throughout the time you're there. So it's like a two week interview, which sounds like hell. And some of them aren't, some of them are literally just work experience and you do the assessment at the end. And then once you do the assessment, it kind of puts you in for a training contract. So you get the work experience and a lot of big, big firms give you sort of money whilst you're there as well, because that's the one thing that puts me off in that you're gonna have to come down to London, stay there for two weeks, it's expensive, but a lot of firms recognize that, which is good. And then at the end of it, you kind of do the job interview for a training contract, and if you get it, you get it. Or, final stage, is you could literally just apply for a straight training contract. So you literally just go, you apply, you do the assessment days, you skip out the two weeks of work experience or whatever it is, you literally just do the assessment day, and then you're like, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't type thing. Also a good way to get a job is be a brand ambassador. I did this for BCLP. Then I got work experience at BCLP through that role. But being a brand ambassador for a law firm enables you to literally work for a year with graduate recruitment with the people that would actually be like yes or no to your job application. And also most of the time you get to go to the office, you get to do a bit of work experience, you get to network. You kind of, when you do firm events as well and you go, oh yeah, I'm the brand ambassador, they're like, oh, you're one of ours. So they're a bit more like keen to talk to you. So that's a really good way to get your foot in the door and a really good way as well to see whether you actually like the firm culture because you could do a vacation scheme for three days, five days, two weeks, 
but that's like they're trying to give you their best impression you're giving them their best impression I don't really think that's like representative of what it would actually be like whereas if you're a brand ambassador it's a year a year's post you know you can really see what a firm is like in that time so yeah that I feel like is a good overview of what a solicitor is like now for barrister <laughs> Okay, so a barrister, their job and practice. I feel like you can categorise a barrister's role into three things. They draft court documents, they advise clients, and they advocate in court. So you can get jobs being a barrister where, depending on, I guess, your area of expertise, that you will do more drafting, you do more advising because of the nature of sort of the work that you're doing. And then there'll be things like crime, for example, where you'll solely really be advocating in court, like, more often than you would draft court documents, you know? It depends on the subject area that you're going to specialise in. And because the solicitor feeds it down from the client, you don't really have any client contact. Obviously, if you do criminal law, then the client will come to court and you'll deal with them in that respect. But client contact for a barrister is very limited in comparison to a solicitor. So it's very much like they're the, the barrister's the lone wolf and the solicitor's with the team. So it sort of depends on what working environment you would want as well. Obviously, a barrister is self-employed, so you don't get the holiday pay, you don't have sort of an employer you don't have anything that's like any security you're purely just on your own although it can give you a great sense of freedom there's no set wage you make your own money and it kind of depends on your reputation and your clients and the people you can bring in so it's one of them things that it's like you might love working on your own and setting your own hours and doing what you want to do but you also might be really poor doing it. Salary, I mean, it's because you're self-employed it's hard to say oh it's this amount but for example um it's been in the news recently where criminal barristers aren't literally making enough money. They are below minimum wage. Um, so some people have made 10 grand a year. Some people are making 100 grand a year. It depends on the practice area. It depends how popular you are. It depends how good you are at your job. It depends on the clients that you get. It depends on your reputation. There's so many factors that are involved. Um, but typically crime and family and human rights, all the stuff that you would probably imagine helps people. You get, there's no money in that. Worse, there's no money. Um, Whereas stuff like feeding the corporate machine, money. Obviously the attire that you wear is, you have the sort of the wig, the gowns, it's only in court and it's only certain court kind of environments that you'd need that. Civil court sort of settings, you don't necessarily, I don't, you don't need it. It's literally, I feel like just crime. I'm trying to think from when I've been on my mini pupillages. It's literally just crime, really. And then some other things that you need the whole shabam for. Most of the other sort of environments is just like business wear. Yeah, so the way barristers work is they're in circuits. So you have circuits of chambers. So you have like the North Eastern Circuit, which is like York and all of Leeds and all that. You've got the London ones. Yeah, so you can kind of get your clients, get your reputation up in your particular circuit. Um, and if you sort of you qualify whether it's best to stick to a certain circuit because then you can build up in that circuit. So, training, how does one become a barrister? Oh, great question. So first off, you need to do your undergrad degree, the same as being a solicitor, or you can do, you need to do it in law, you can do it in not law. If you don't do it in law, you need to do the GDL, the same. Obviously this time around, because you're self-employed as a barrister, no one's paying for the GDL for you. So, you know, you've got to fork out cash for that. Then after that, you do the BPTC, which is the Bar Practice Training Course. I don't know. Oh, you can tell that I don't want to be a barrister. I have no idea. I'll put it here. And BPTC, that's what you do. You do it for a year. Uh, it's like 20 grand. It's really expensive. And that's just the course costs, let alone living fees. Um, again, nobody's paying for that for you. So once you've done the BPTC, which is basically a like practice course for a year, you do things like mooting, learn how to advocate, all the things you might have done in an undergrad law degree, but like accelerated um, and like really like umped up and it's way more focused on getting you the skills to actually become a barrister and advocate for others. Um, so once you've done that, then you do pupillage, which is like a year shadowing on the job. Uh, you just go around and shadow a bar like a more senior barrister. Once you've done that, then you can kind of be called to the bar and actually be barrister however however the issues with it are that to get a pupillage in the first place is bloody hard and then once you're on the pupillage the places for sort of tenancy after pupillage so actually when you want a job are like even more reduced so a lot of people are doing a bptc obviously paying for all that themselves and then not being able to get a pupillage and even if they've got pupillage they're not being able to be called to the bar whereas i feel like with a solicitor once you've got a training contract you're in you're made unless you like mess up massively you kind of have got a guaranteed job so 
that's the, the other side to it. Like barristers, once you're in and you've actually got a tenancy, you've got like a place in the chambers, you're done, right? But that's so much easier said than done. So again, how to get a job. Um, the best ways are to go to court, learn how, you know, even solicitor advocates and barristers in your local magistrates or crown court advocate for others there, take notes, do mooting competitions, do negotiation competitions, do anything that can get you mixing with others, you know, in that environment where you're sort of advocating or you're using the skills that you would need to be a barrister. Even learn how to like draft documents and things like that because I feel like that's the side that almost gets forgotten when you want to be a barrister. Um, and obviously mini pupillages as well. So you have assessed mini pupillage and non-assessed mini pupillages. The non-assessed ones are basically just like work experience. Assessed are obviously work experience with the aim to kind of get you a pupillage at the end of it or get you some type of job. Um, and mostly you can kind of apply for them in your third year of your law degree um, or third year of your degree. They're prioritised for those type of people because they want the most experience you can get before actually doing it because that's when you find it most beneficial. So yeah, I feel like that accurately summarises kind of in my eyes the difference between a solicitor and a barrister and what you need to do if you want to become each one. Any questions, put them in the comments below. And just before I sign out on this video, I kind of just want to mention three things. Firstly, in the description, I'm going to put loads of links to my favourite sort of law sites, explaining the differences between a solicitor and a barrister, any sort of good links. Um, I know, for example, Legal Cheek, they have the top barristers chambers and they have the top um, city law firms. They rank them. It's like a little database where you can put in like, who pays the most and who has the most jobs and stuff like that and it's a really really great way to look at all the firms and all the opportunities available um, and then there are other providers that list like all the training contract deadlines and things like that I'll put them all in the description the second thing to mention is if you want to pursue either of these roles commercial awareness is something that's going to be mentioned all the time like you have no idea get to law school every other day commercial awareness commercial awareness um, it almost becomes a dirty word you know but basically just to know what is going on in your sort of sphere of business you know with brexit i hate to say it i hate to mention brexit but brexit things that are happening politically how that influences sort of the the sector that you want to go in that's something that you really really need to know and something that's going to be really really helpful for you when you go to the interview stage and when you're sort of applying for these jobs because it gives employers sort of confidence that you understand how the world is impacting the work that you'll be doing in that role. So yeah, read newspapers, look at the news, think about how that impacts the area of law that you want to do. And finally, my last word of advice would be to get work experience in both sectors. Regardless of whether you want to be a barrister, regardless of whether you want to be a solicitor, get work experience in both. Because even though you might want to be a barrister and you think doing solicitor's work will just be counterproductive because it's not going to get you in the right direction, you can always say in an interview for pupillage or for the BPTC, I know I want to be a barrister because I have done solicitor's work and I didn't like X, Y, Z about it. And that's different to being a barrister because X, Y, Z, therefore I know I want to be a barrister, you know? So you can use a negative experience from doing work experience you not, might not necessarily want to do or think is going in the right direction for you career-wise. You can use the skills from it, use the knowledge and experience and twist it into a way that makes it kind of show that you want to do what you want to do and it kind of affirms that I want to do what I want to do because I've tried other stuff and I know that I don't like it and I've tried this and I know that I do like it. And I just think it gives employees is more confidence of you you not just focus solely on this and then there might be other things that are more suited for you so yeah get work experience in both regardless just just get out there and also in first year at uni regardless of what you're studying just go and get work experience I know most people think first year is like first year doesn't count first year in a way doesn't count no but you still need to get a good grade but I kind of you may want to look at it and go I want to go out but I looked at my first year thinking I want to get so much work experience in my first year so that if it does impact my grades it doesn't matter because the grade isn't going towards my overall classification and then in second year my grade is going towards my overall classification I've already got a beefed up CV behind me so I can go into second year and be picky of what I want which is exactly what I did and honestly it put me in such good stead it basically meant that everything that I applied for in second year I got so, you know, I'm just gonna put that out there and leave that as my final bit of advice. So I hope this video has been helpful for you. As I said, any questions about whether you want to become a sister, barrister, roots in, my personal experience of them both, because I have done work experience with them both. Um, yeah, ask me in the comments below. Uh, I hope you like this video. I'll see you in the next video. I'll see you next week. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.